What's going on everybody? Ken in here hanging out. We're over by the pond and uh, I'm joined by my good friend Larry Wood. Hello everyone. That's right. Uh, I like when Larry shows up because uh, I was just telling him he keeps me honest. We've got a really cool question for today's Ask Cam Kennan. Now these are questions that uh, that our viewers submit to our Patreon page. Uh, if you'd like to help us out and go to Patreon and get your question and answered right here on the main channel here on YouTube, go to patreon.com slash camp Kennan. Uh, help us continue to make really fun content that educates as well as entertains. So today's question comes from Alexander Lice. Lice? Lice? L-Y-S-E. Mm -hmm. I'm lice, shouting you out. Yeah. Lice? Mm -hmm. I'm going with lice. Mm -hmm. He's rescued a golden Greek tortoise that for the last 10 years had been held tied with a rope through a drilled hole in its shell. The tortoise seems curious and active. Can a tortoise, excuse me, I was reading that wrong, uh, a tortoise experience long-term trauma or do they have the mental ability to remember trauma long term? That's a really cool question. And I wanted to bring Larry in on it because Larry does a lot of work with hawksbill sea turtles in particular. He's a marine biologist. If you haven't seen the video where we released some hawksbill turtles, you may want to go check that out. We'll have a link to it uh, in this video. But in the meantime, um, you actually study these animals in, in real detail. And why I called you was because in kind of my anecdotal experience okay just being around here i do seem to notice that the tortoises this seem to fall into patterns mm -hmm. that i would guess maybe they're remembering something i know these animals travel your animals travel long sure. distances so sure. maybe explain to us and help answer that question for alexander uh we'll go back and forth and have a discussion but what do you think well uh studies have shown that tortoises particular uh red-footed tortoises can remember how to solve mazes to get to food over a very long period of time. And it's like, kind of like that classic uh, mouse or rat maze yep. where there's you know cheese at one end and there's kind of a labyrinth and the thing has to figure out how to get there. And you can test them to see how well they remember that. So the more times you go through the maze, the better you're going to get at it, you know, given that the food is left in the same place. So one of the measures of kind of learning is how quickly the animal figures out the maze, how to get to food. Very cool. And the kind of the back end of that is how long the animal remembers that. So let's say that those tests were done and you wait a month and you suddenly reintroduce it back into the same system, you can again time the animal to see how well it remembers that over time. Then you can wait two months or a year or ten years or whatever. Okay. And of course we know that mammals like rats and mice can learn, you know, pretty well. I don't know exactly what the timing is, but we, you know, know through laboratory studies that they can learn pretty well. They figure it out. Well, the same types of tests were done with red-footed tortoises many years ago. And one of the interesting things is not only can they learn how to get to the food through the maze, but they, uh, when I say they, the researchers that were doing this, waited a 10 years wow. to test them again. And sure enough, the animals performed remarkably well, as if they had remembered that. So the long answer here, sort of, <laughs> is that if the animal can remember patterns to get to a positive type of reinforcement or positive response from food, can the animal also remember negative experiences? This was kind of what I think the question of... Right, the, definitely. So it, you kind of say, well, maybe they can. You right. Know? So, but there's been no long-term studies uh, with any negative reinforcement, has there? That's right, because typically those studies aren't generally accepted, you know, in the ethics of doing, you know, of studies course, typically, of you know. However, there are some other things that we see sort of anecdotally like you do around here is that, you know, I go out into the ocean and we scuba dive along and we find a wild sea turtle. And in the case of the hawksbills that I study, they tend to be pretty complacent with our approach. You know, they allow us to get pretty close and I'm able to, to capture the turtles. We bring them up to the surface and we put them in a boat and we'll take measurements and we'll put tags in them and we'll take samples and do a variety of things that aren't particularly painful or but you know it's it's kind of like an alien abduction you know? yeah exactly no anal probes dude uh, you know so we finish this whole process up and we put them back in the ocean and there have been a number of times when i've gone back in the ocean not only that day but a week later a month later or a year later and the turtles don't avoid us <laughs> any differently than they had after that experience or you know than they had before the experience after the experience they didn't behave much differently so 
maybe I'm not assuming this right, but I would assume that's kind of a negative experience. Gotcha. But maybe they don't perceive it as a negative experience, or it has to happen a bunch of times. Okay. For them to finally to really catch lock on. in. Well, we know that turtles and tortoises, or at least the ones that I work with, Larry, are creatures of habit. Right. Um, these are animals that, for the most part, not your animals, not a pelagic species, but turtles and tortoises, or tortoises in particular, mm -hmm. like we're talking about your tortoise there, Alex. Um, this is an animal that in nature would have a smaller home range. Uh, this is an animal that's going to want to know where its water source is, where is the best uh, foods and weeds growing, and they follow kind of a pattern uh, along this, this kind of home range. So memory is going to be important. Right. Um, it's definitely going to be an evolutionary advantage for this animal to remember. To map out its surroundings. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I do think that, you know, not a lot of us give credit to these animals for being brain surgeons or geniuses, but there is some level of reptilian intellect, if you will, that gets them through their environment. Well, you know, we always think of it as intelligence is hard to compare because they're really smart for being sea turtles. Okay. You know, we're smart at being humans and they're smart at being sea turtles. You know, they can do things that amaze us and we're still learning about them. We're, we're talking briefly about how they navigate. Yeah. You know, they can remember, you know, gosh, where to go over, you know, thousands of miles, you know, in the ocean. So anyway, they're, they're smart enough. They know exactly how to get themselves where they need to go and what they need to do to survive, you know. So. Now... I wanted to also, the reason I was over by the pond, guys, is uh, you had mentioned, Alex, that there was, your animal had been tethered by its shell. Now, I wanted to just give a quick story about the animals you're looking at here. Those are the giant Asian wood turtle you're looking at right there. And I've got about 50 of the, these animals in here, Larry. And it turns out that many of those turtles came to me uh, through a group called the Turtle Survival Alliance. Oh, yes, yes. And a fantastic group. Yep. And they work mostly with freshwater turtles and tortoises. Uh, but they basically got these animals out of the food markets in Asia. Mm. And when I was pulling some of them out, I noticed they actually had some of those tethers in their shells, in the marginal shells. Now, this one, actually, look at this. This one was notched, if we look right here. Uh, we were talking about tagging. I believe that this is one of the TSA notches. Uh, they have a system of notching where they notch the uh, marginal scoots here. Uh, marginal coastals. Those are coastals, yeah, correct? Right marginal. Are these marginals? The outside, okay, right. marginals. Around the outside, yeah. around the outside. So uh, these are the vertebrals. These are the coastal scoots, mm -hmm. and then these are the marginal scoots. Uh, anyhow, there is right there a little bit of a notch. Now I have seen straight up holes drilled right through these animals where they were being hung in the food markets. Uh, and that's just obviously a stressful situation. Now, I think, and again, this is all anecdotal. This is just uh, my hypothesis. But Larry, it seems like, you know, you once talked to me about a really cool book called Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. Mm, right, um, yeah, yeah. You know, uh, a fellow named Robert Sapolsky. Okay, yeah. well, really cool, and the gist of it is, we were talking about how human beings, uh, because maybe of our neocortex, the new brain, our higher intellect, um, we tend to look forward into, into the future. We can generate our own stress, which right. may not actually exist. Whereas an animal like a zebra or a giraffe, yeah. this is an animal that lives on the Serengeti, it grazes and grazes and grazes. Its stress hormones don't get flooded into the system, into its body, until something's attacking it. Right. So a lion, uh, pride of lions come, the females are trying to get the zebras. Uh, the zebras start running, they're stressed. Uh, maybe fight a or fight, fight or flight response. response. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What happens? A zebra gets caught, and a half an hour later, after that zebra has been consumed, the rest of the herd is what? They're just grazing again. Mm -hmm. Do they remember? Uh, that's a great question. I don't know. Well, you know? You know, they respond. And so they're able to go back to a resting state. What happens is with humans a lot of times is we spend a lot of time worrying. And so we can keep those stress hormones elevated. And that's what chronic stress really is. It can be hard for people to calm down. And that's kind of the gist of the book. The gentleman studied baboons. And he was looking at the effects of stress and stress hormones on the overall health of those animals, which translates pretty closely to us. And all the chronic health people get, or health issues people get from stress, are the kinds of things that result from 
uh, those elevated stress hormones that kind of never get to drop again, you know. And that was kind of the reason for the name of the book. But uh, he uh, he studied the effects of stress on, on those bad moods. There you go. Pioneering work, yeah. Yeah, really cool stuff. So I guess, guys, what I'm trying to say is perhaps there's some kind of... Well, there's some kind of mechanism inside these animals, since they are animals that are basically living in the wild to where they can be consumed, maybe there is some kind of natural failsafe that these animals possess so that they don't completely get stressed out or have traumatic experiences. That being said, they can definitely learn, uh, you know, from different stressors out there. And I think that's an evolutionary advantage as well. So, I don't know. I think, uh, I think we may have answered the question. I'll tell you what, Alex. Be very nice to your tortoise and give it the best possible habitat and life you possibly can do. And that goes for everyone out there. What we aim to do here uh, at this channel is to educate and try and get you guys to create really cool habitats for the animals under your care in captivity. Uh, this way, you know, the animal can function as if as close as possible to its existence in the wild. And then hopefully some of you guys will go even further like my friend Larry Wood and you'll become conservationists and research biologists, get a PhD like Larry and really study the mysteries of these animals so that you can come back here one day and uh, tell us the answers. Yeah, yeah, sounds great. All right, very cool, man. Hey, listen, if you want to go check out Larry's work, you can follow him on Instagram. What is that? The Florida Hawksbill Project is, on yeah. Instagram. Yeah. So check him out there and uh, also go to the Save the Sea Turtle Found the National Save the Sea Turtle right. Foundation. Yeah. Uh, dot o r g. Yeah, it's Save the Sea Turtle dot org. All right, the very National cool. Save the Sea Turtle Foundation. All right, we'll get Larry Thanks. back here again for uh, more questions. And I just wanted to show you some really cool animals. I hope you guys enjoyed this. Remember, go to patreoncom slash Uh if you want to get your question and answer. Or if you want to support the channel, you can also like and subscribe. And don't forget to hit the notifications button right there, somewhere down below, so you guys are kept aware as to when we are uploading new videos. All right, everybody. Talk to you soon. Thanks, Alex, for the question. So long.